and main piece of equipment where we have to get started with the glass blowing process is our furnace over there. You can see that nice line of orange coming out from behind the door. That furnace is rocking at 2,150 degrees Fahrenheit and it is uh, full to the brim of clear crystal molten glass. Um, it, we fill it once a week and it holds up to about 700 pounds of glass at any given time. Um, and then we move down the line here and we have our pipe warmer that is preheating all of our stainless steel blow pipes and punty rods. And um, those tools are very, very important for the glass blowing process because obviously that's what we need in order to pull the glass out of the furnace. Um, and those are being preheated to about 900 degrees at the head of the pipe um, in order to allow the molten glass to adhere to it. And then we move down to our final piece of equipment. We have two on right now, but these are our reheating chambers. And these can temperature and maintain our piece throughout the process. So with that being said, we can go ahead and get started. Kelly's gonna go ahead and grab her pipe here, and she's gonna take her first gather out of the furnace. And so like I said, we're gonna be making Merlin's hat from the sword, of the sword in the stone. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with that story. It's the story about Arthur, who um, obviously pulls the sword from the stone, but leading up to that point, you know, that was the prophecy that he who pulls the sword from the stone will be the king of England. So he, one day he discovers the stone when he's training with a bow and arrow. He shoots his arrow into the woods, he goes looking for it, and uh, that's when he comes across Merlin, who obviously we're making his wizard cap today. And Merlin is an old wizard and he kind of takes Arthur under his wing and he kind of begins to teach him. He becomes kind of like an apprentice or a disciple under Merlin. Um, and he kind of trains him uh, through different trials and uh, they turn into different animals to teach him different integral parts of being a leader. And that's, that's really, really interesting. So what Kelly has just done here is she has pulled a layer of glass out of the furnace on the head of her pipe. And when we're going into our furnace, we, we plunge the pipe in past the layer of glass and we make a couple 365 degree rotations and that glass will just adhere to that pipe and get pulled out. And Kelly, Kelly's taken a couple gathers here out of that furnace before getting started. And like I said, all of that glass in the furnace is all clear colorless glass. So we have what we call frit here that we're gonna be using which is just finely crushed up glass into little chips. And we can use this to colorize the glass. So now that Kelly has all of that material that she needs for her first bit of, uh, of making in this process, she's using a tool that we call a block. And this is a, a really vital tool um, that was actually invented by factory workers uh, to rapidly get the glass into, a sh into that kind of rounded Q-tip shape on the end of the pipe. Uh, we don't necessarily need the tool, but it's really, really handy uh, and just makes the process a lot easier. So Kelly goes in because what that block does is it kind of puts a skin on the surface of the material. It gives it a little bit more stability. So um, whoever's holding the pipe has a lot more control over that glass. So, going into the reheating chamber, she kind of reheats that skin, go back and do another shape, and then we'll be introducing the bubble most likely into the glass. And by using that block, we're skimming the surface, putting a cold layer right on the very outside while that core stays nice and hot. And that's really important for when we blow the bubble into the glass. So Kelly blows into the end of the blowpipe, capping it with, the th with her thumb at the end. And the only way that that air can move is forward into that molten glass. So there we can see we've introduced a tiny bubble, maybe no, no bigger than the size of a golf ball inside of that head of material. So now that we have our bubble introduced, we now have a hollow form. So now we can begin layering color onto the surface. And when we're applying frit to the glass, it has to be a nice and even temperature um, because it's actually that molten glass that's heating up that frit enough to allow it to stick to the surface. If we were gonna be colorizing this with, say, um, 
a piece of color bar or a solid rod of glass, we would need to preheat that to about 950 degrees in order for it to adhere to that pipe. Very similar to how we need to preheat the heads of our blow pipes. But the frit is really handy because the pieces are so small and they can heat up so quickly that just the heat from that furnace can allow them to stick to the surface. We do have a question. Yeah, what's our question? What colors are we using? So Merlin's cap is traditionally seen in, in media and popular culture as blue, and we have a nice royal blue frit. So it's kind of like a nice light able to pass through it, or we can't visibly see through that glass. So that's kind of the difference. When we're working in a more sculptural way, when we're trying to recreate something, um, unless it is transparent, we like to stick to a nice opaque color and opaque blue is personally one of my favorite colors. So we're gonna take a couple layers of that frit, but it's really, really hard to tell that true color once we get that material molten. Um, it really doesn't show its true color until it is completely cooled down after the annealing cycle when the piece is completed, but we'll go over that a little bit later. So Kelly's going in here and um, just continuing to layer that glass on. That's one of the, um, one of the few downsides of using frit is that that frit, the chunks are very, you know, they're small chunks and they create a more speckled appearance. So we have to do a couple layers in order to create that full colorization of the material. So when we're inside that reheating chamber, we're kind of really looking for the movement and we're looking for everything to be nice and melted in. We need everything to be homogenous. That's a very important uh, vocabulary term in, uh, in glass blowing because uh, we, we need everything to be even. That's a very important thing in our process, especially with temperature um, because we need everything to blow out nice and evenly. We need everything to shape properly, the bubble to expand at an even rate. Um, otherwise, we'll have a harder time, which we don't want. We want everything to go nice and smooth when we're working with molten glass. So by going on with that block, she's kind of skimming that color, uh, making sure it's all nice and melted in, uh, so we no longer have separate chips. We have one full body of glass. Everything is the same now. And while Kelly has been uh, applying the color to the, to the uh, hat part portion, Sandy here has been pulling yellow stringers. And stringers are just very, very thin strings of glass that we can actually, excuse me, use to draw on the surface of the, of the cap. So we're gonna go for a more stylized Merlin wizard cap. Um, and we're going to, or Kelly is going to be painting on the stars and the moons, similar to um, the Fantasia rendition of the Merlin's cap. And this process of applying the color and getting all of the preparatory work done usually is the longest part of the process. Um, getting everything set up before we do any exponential blowing or anything uh, regarding the shaping, uh, everything has to be set up prior to that. So um, Kelly's just making sure that everything is nice and evenly coated, all of that color is, is where it needs to be. We have very little um, areas where the color bleeds through. And while we're working, we also uh, need to be weary of the length of our bubble and of that mass of material. So when we're, when we're tapping in this tray and gathering up all that color, the glass naturally wants to stretch away from the pipe. So Kelly will come back a couple times and use that block to Re reposition the glass and squat it back up on the pipe because we want to keep that material as close as we can to the head of the pipe. It's a very important part of the process. And, Kel and, and Sandy is just over here yet again making sure that we can get a good amount of those stringers because we're going to be drawing a lot of uh, stars and moons on the, on the uh, wizard cap. And it's actually a really, really cool process of pulling stringers. It does exactly what the name implies. We're taking a molten mass of material, um, coloring it, 
and stretching it out. Maybe Sandy could do, do it here for the camera so that way everybody can get a kind of a better view of what he's doing. Um, it's a really, really cool process kind of watching the materiality of the glass in Holton State. The majority of that blue color, Sandy's going to be finishing up those stringers. Kelly is now beginning to get this into a nice and even shape. We have our color layered nicely on there. Uh, with Frit, it's kind of difficult to get rid of all of the clear spots and little windows that are going to remain in it, but that just kind of gives it a nice, cool look. Kind of reminds us that this piece is going to be made of glass. Excellent. So now that we have this nice and shaped up, Kelly's going to go ahead and inflate that bubble a little bit more and get set up to take another gather of material on top of this. So when we're, when we're gathering, we need to make sure that that bubble is nice and even, like I said already, because um, that's very important for the expansion of the piece. Uh, and we need to make sure that that shape is nice and squat and in that Q-tip form. Um, but we can kind of compress that material um, with that tool that she was just using, that newspaper, to push the glass, inflate the bubble, and keep it nice and squat. And here we can see Sandy pulling a stringer for our drawing here. Just using this pair of tweezers, he's gently pulling and allowing that glass to cool and stretch at an even rate so we have a nice, even string of glass. And what's really amazing about this as well is this piece of material was just around 2,000 degrees uh, but after we pull this stringer here, within five minutes it's going to be back down to room temperature and able to be handled so that way we can get a nice good grip on it when we're, when we're drawing on the stars and the moons. And just using those tweezers here, just kind of applying some cold shock to it, it breaks right off just like that. Really, really amazing. So now we have a good stock of yellow stringers to draw on those yellow stars and moons. And what's really nice is he just finished that. They're really in sync here. They're good on time with each other. So Kelly is now ready to take a nice gather out of the furnace. Her bubble is expanded a little bit more. Uh, everything is nice and stabilized. The glass isn't moving a whole lot, and that's really important. We need that bubble to be able to withstand the temperature of the furnace while we're in there getting that final gather of material. Yeah, what's the other question? Okay, that's a great question. So the question was, what is the consistency of the glass when it's in the furnace versus when it comes out? So when the glass is in that furnace, in that nice atmosphere of a constant 2150, it's a similar viscosity to room temperature honey. And you can see right here how that molten material kind of cools off. And this is what we call a strip gather. So that's a really, really good indicator of that viscosity of the material. Um, it's, it's not quite a liquid and it's not quite a solid. It's what we call a non-Newtonian fluid, meaning it is, in both, it is in both a solid state and a liquid state. Really fascinating. It's one of the very few uh, elements uh, that can be in that state of matter, kind of in between both. Um, but when it comes out of the furnace, it's just slowly getting more and more uh, rigid. At once it's in that room temperature atmosphere. It, it goes from a honey-like state, very, very runny, very fluid-like, and then it just slowly becomes more and more kind of like taffy. It goes from honey to molasses to taffy to solid, basically, uh, <laughs> to put it in, a, in simple terms. Um, but we're, when, we, when we come out, we need to go into that reheating chamber uh, within 30 seconds or so before the glass becomes too rigid to manipulate. So um, it's, it's very quick in that change uh, in temperature from going from that liquid-like state to that solid state. So now that we've taken our final gather, Kelly has blocked up that new fresh layer of glass because um, it doesn't really have any structure. Again, because it's in that honey-like state, it's kind of flowing around that mass underneath. So where were we in the story of the sword and the stone? So Arthur has been teaching, uh, or Merlin has been teaching Arthur uh, all of the different trials, of what it takes 
Um, they go through a lot of uh, different adventures together. And then the king, uh, at the time, he, uh, he proposes to um, have a tournament, a jousting tournament, to decide who's going to be the king. Um, and you know, that's when, that's when Arthur unknowingly pulls the sword from the stone, and that completes the prophecy. Uh, of he who pulls the sword from the stone will be the, the rightful king uh, of England. So now that we have that material uh, nice and heated up evenly, we're now beginning to inflate that bubble out a little bit more. We're beginning to do uh, the, the shaping of the hat, which is you know, that iconic conical form. So Kelly has a really handy tool. Uh, she has a blow hose um, because normally the glass blowing process with Sandy here, he would be the one that would be blowing into the end of the blow pipe and introducing that air into the pipe. It makes it a little bit easier for Kelly to not have to worry about both blowing and shaping. Um, but due to current circumstances, we have a blow hose, which is also a really, really handy tool because it allows you to do a majority of this process on your own, um, which we like to think of glass blowing as a team sport here. Obviously, we have Sandy here to provide assistance uh, for some of the other things that would be much more difficult for Kelly to do on her own. But the blowing and shaping, that's a really nice thing to be able to do by yourself. You know exactly how much air pressure you need because you're the one giving it. So we come here with the blow hose. And this tool that she has here, like I said before, is simply just a couple sheets of folded up newspaper. Um, and it's, it works in a similar way to the blocking tool and that it is soaked in water and that water uh, absorbed in there evaporates when it comes into contact with the molten glass and it creates a layer of steam and that's preventing the paper from burning and igniting and it's also cooling down the glass. Um, we can see our, the bubble is slowly beginning to inflate. We need to kind of do this a little bit slowly because a conical form is a notoriously difficult shape to achieve. Though it is a really simple shape uh, in terms of the geometry of it, uh, it is a difficult form uh, to achieve on the blowpipe, a nice and clean uh, cone form. So we're kind of gently blowing everything out, making sure that the area uh, of the bubble that's closest to the pipe, or what we call the shoulder, is nice and thin. We want to retain the majority of the thickness in that glass towards the tip of the bubble, because the tip of that bubble is going to be the bottom of the wizard cap. So obviously we want something nice and bottom heavy, so we don't have to worry about it tipping over or anything like that. So now, um, Kelly's done a really good job of setting up for this conical shape. So you just saw, she, when she came back to the bench, she swung downward, and she allowed gravity to do that stretching for her. And now she's applying what we call the constriction line or the jack line, neckline. It has a lot of different names, but that's what um, that tool that she's using, the jacks, is best for. And that's putting in a little bit of a line in that material. And that's going to be our point of constriction or our weak point, uh, where we'll actually be removing the piece from this pipe and transferring it a little bit later in the process. So she's squeezing down rolling back and forth on the rails of the bench and putting in that line nice and evenly and rounded. And now that we have that line introduced, that line is also going to be our point of symmetry. I don't want to be too big before the throat hurts. So that initial stretch that Kelly did kind of gave it a little bit of length from the beginning. So now when we go into the reheating chamber here and begin introducing that heat back into the material, we're going to be doing it behind that neckline, really stretching it out and getting that cone shape. Oh, sweet. So now that this stringer is cooled down nicely, I can show this to the camera here. Let me hook myself back up. There we go. So this, um, is that little yellow stringer that Sandy had just pulled a couple minutes ago. It's cooled down enough to touch. Um, and this is what we're going to be using and introducing a torch to this to heat this up and do those drawings on the surface of the glass. So that's, that's really cool. So we've got a good stockpile of these stringers over here ready to be used. 
So now Kelly has come back from her heat and now she's beginning to really introduce uh, that air and really setting up that conical shape. Our bubble is expanding a lot. We've got our shape set up nicely. And again, that newspaper is really there to retain that thickness at the base of that cap. So one really nice thing as well about having an assistant is Sandy can go ahead and take over for any heaps or flashes uh, that need to be done. And another really nice thing is they, they're able to communicate nicely with each other um, to get the point across of what needs to happen. It's a nice thing to have when we're working in a hot shop as a team that can move fluidly and can communicate really, really well. We've been all working together for a really long time. So it's cool to see everybody come together for these demonstrations to make something really nice. So it looks like we're ready to paint on um, the stars and the moon. So this is a really, really cool process. And, and we'll make sure the camera is right there to be able to see it. So we're, we're literally going to be using uh, these stringers to draw on the stars and the moons. And it's, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do, but we're just slowly introducing heat into this stringer here using this hot torch. And I'm not sure if it's difficult to tell or not, but we can see that that stringer, the tip of it is really beginning to thicken up. And when we, when we draw with it, we stick it to the surface, and then we begin to drag the stringer across the body of material. And we're drawing on the star. Super cool. Cane drawing is a really, really difficult process but when it's executed right, it looks phenomenal. It looks great. So we've got our first star. And we're just gonna take some time to continually do this here to make sure that we get, the, get it all nice and covered. Yes, that's a great question. So. Uh, the pair in the front is obviously Kelly's prescription that she needs, um, but the pair in the back is a pair of uh, didymium glasses or shades. And that's a very, very important um, piece of eyewear, protective eyewear, because of that torch. Um, that torch is an oxygen and propane torch, um, and it gets up to around 3,000 degrees. Um, and when it comes into contact with that glass, it puts off a very, very bright light um, that after prolonged exposure can do some damage to your eyes. And we can see that Sandy as well has a pair on too. Um, so uh, myself, uh, I'm not looking directly at that flame while I'm in here uh, because it is very, very bright um, and very intense. So she's got two pairs on just for her own protection. She's got just added safety uh, while we're in here. And yeah, those, those shades kind of dull that light down. And they make it a lot less bright and a lot less intense for your eyes to handle. That's a great question. I'm, I'm surprised that they caught that. So again, we're just going on here, adding on, drawing on all of the stars and moons. And if you can see here, Kelly is very, very kind of gently following that cane with the torch to really melt it in and make it all nice and even. So we've got our other moon here. do a couple more here.
And it's just really amazing to kind of watch the glass drag across the surface and heat up. And that Sandy, what he's doing in between is taking what we call flashes. And those are just really short heats, uh, not so much to heat the material up to shape, but just to make sure everything is nice and stable. Um, we are working with a soda lime glass, which is a soft glass. Um, those of you watching at home, probably familiar with Pyrex, um, bakeware, things like that. That glass has a different chemical composition that allows it to get up to a higher temperature, say in the oven. Uh, it can get up to 500 degrees and come out to room temperature and be fine. It can handle that stress of that heat entering and escaping rapidly. Um, but our glass needs to be gradually brought up in heat and gradually brought down in heat. So when it comes out of the furnace, we're pretty good until we reach the, the danger zone, which is roughly about 900 degrees. And that's one of the reasons why glass blowing is so difficult um, for beginners is to really kind of understand that heat. Um, these guys are really, really good at understanding the temperature of the material and knowing when to go and take a flash. But we can see here, if you look in the shot, the, the color is starting to come through. This is still not um, the true color. It still has a slight tinge in it from the temperature. It's still, you know, well over a thousand degrees. Um, but that true royal blue color isn't going to come out until it's room temperature. But a really good indicator that we're at a stable temperature is being able to see a little bit of the true color. Another good reason to take that flash is to make sure that all of those uh, canes are nice and settled into the surface of our hat. So we're continuing to draw on everything. We're going for a moon here. And it's just, it's really amazing to see the material work in this way. Personally, haven't seen cane drawing in a very long time. It is a very difficult process. But she's making it look very easy. Yeah, do one more star and then done. Okay. Nice. So they're going to go for one more star here, and then they're going to be done adding on all of the decorative bits on the glass. And this is when we're going to go ahead and do the final shaping and give the, give the wizard cap the nice point that it's known for, the nice tall cylindrical point, or conical point, not cylindrical point. Excellent. So we've got the final decorative bit added on. Sandy's going to go in, take a nice flash, and then give it back to Kelly. Now that, now that all of the decorative bits are added on to the material, uh, Sandy can hand it back now that Kelly can be back at the bench um, to kind of figure out and decide what her next moves are going to be to finish this up. There's going to be a little bit more blowing. Um, seems Kelly didn't want to inflate the whole thing out quite yet before we put those stars and moons on, kind of maintaining that nice rounded form. Um, we're, we are really set up nicely for that conical shape. We don't have a puffed up shoulder. It's kind of coming off of the pipe um, at that neckline. It's kind of set up for that dropout and that shaping. So we can see in the reheating chamber that Kelly is inside, um, but that neckline is right outside of the door. It's kind of difficult to see from the angle you guys are looking at, but that neckline is right outside of the door. Because um, as soon as you go past that first set of doors in the reheating chamber, you're in a, a very contained atmosphere of temperature. So even being out the slightest, that material is getting a lot less temperature blasted directly onto it. So by kind of going in, shaping everything, we have that real nice orange glow, uh, and that's a real good indicator of how well Kelly was able to maintain the heat uh, and, and position the heat exactly where she needed it to be. So 
So again, just using that newspaper to set up that shape as well, kind of going in, doing very light squeezing. The newspaper is a very, very handy tool because it allows us to conform and shape the glass using our hand. We can, we can pinch and squeeze with fingers. We can use the palm of our hand uh, for trying to make nice and smooth transition, keeping the line nice and straight uh, throughout the silhouette of the piece. So it looks like we're done blowing. The blow hose has been taken off the pipe. I feel like the rest of the time we're gonna be stretching uh, and doing some other shaping here. And one other really handy thing about doing those cane drawings uh, before uh, the piece was completed in the shaping is that temperature of the reheat chamber is allowing um, those additions of material to smooth over on the surface. They're heating up a little bit and they're kind of flattening and conforming and being uh, completely homogenized with, the, with um, the body of the cap. So this pendulum motion uh, is, is really cool. It's not just for show. It's an important part of the process in using gravity to stretch the glass out. So by hanging down and doing a very, very light swinging motion, we can add a lot of height or length to the piece. So we went from a more rounded ball into now into more of a, uh, a, a shallow uh, cone. So we can see now that we've stretched the glass out. Uh, the reheat chamber throughout the process, we're, we're working further and further, we're heating further and further outside of the reheat chamber because as we're stretching, we wanna make sure that uh, the further we're working down, the more stable we want the glass to be, to keep it on center, to keep it nice and symmetrical. So by angling down, we can really see um, the levels of heat in this piece of glass. So what's closest to the pipe is obviously going to be the coolest portion of the material. One, because that's what we want, and two, because uh, it is the, the last thing in the reheat chamber and the first thing out. So the tip of the bubble is always going to be the hottest. And that's really important, because we're going in here and we're beginning to use the blades of the, of the jacks, which is the tool that we use to squeeze it's also a really, really handy tool in that it has a lot of purposes. We can use the blades in a horizontal orientation uh, to shape the bubble, um, keep a nice straight line. Um, we can introduce air and, um, and blow into the glass at the same time and really get that nice conical shape pushed in. And again, what's really, really handy about doing this conical form is that we can really, really stretch the glass out. We can get it nice and lengthened. And then we can go on. She's going on with the blades of the jacks, having a little bit of air introduced. Nice. So now, that we have this blown out nicely, we need to give that cone a nice pointed tip. That's very, that's important to the iconic Merlin uh, wizard cap. So everything now from here on out is going to be done manually. We're gonna have to pull and stretch that out, or at least that's what, what Kelly is gonna plan to do for her piece. So we can see in the reheat chamber, focusing the majority of that heat See where the heat is directed. The front, the front half is where we're getting the majority of that heat. So using these tweezers, we can begin to put a line into the glass or an area that we can pull, creating a little knob and just gently turning and pulling using the diamond shears, which are just a pair of scissors that are shaped in a diamond orientation. And those are really, really handy tool because they allow you to work in the round. We also use straight shears, but they were going to cut a flat line into the glass. Because we're working from a, center, a central point, having a, pair of twe or having a pair of shears that's in a diamond orientation allow us to pull and not, um, and not throw off the symmetry of our vessel. So we've started to begin to pull that point nicely. And we'll probably do that one or two more times to make sure that line follows through nicely. And then we'll have a nice cap that will be 
yeah. ready to transfer. Oh, you're not going to transfer it? Okay. We're going to squish down the bottom first. Okay, I got you. So we're going to boost the heat back up into this just a little bit more because we can see there is a tiny hump um, towards the top of the piece that we want to get rid of. We want that line to follow nicely all the way through. So this is really nice uh, to have Sandy here as well to have his assistance because he is able to turn the pipe while Kelly can be outside of the bench and have a much better view um, of what we're seeing here. And it looks like, she, are you putting in folds and creases? Yeah. Nice, so this is gonna be really cool. It looks like she's gonna fold the cap over itself. So this tag here, or taglio, is just a flat metal paddle. Um, when we're working with molten glass, we can also use uh, wood paddles, cherry wood paddles, which is a lot less abrasive to the glass, but this metal paddle is really nice because it's nice for putting in nice and solid creases that are gonna be very visible. And because the cap is made of fabric, um, we wanna kind of mimic those creases that would be present in a fabric cap. Nice. We're gonna add a couple more of those. And that hot torch is really, really nice for this. Because it's at that 3,000 degrees, it's, it's running much hotter than the glass initially does in the furnace. So it allows us to spot heat certain areas of the material uh, where we wanna make that mark without heating up the whole body and throwing off uh, the shape that we've set up already. We don't want the bubble to crease in on itself, but we can use that hot torch to really lay in the heat exactly where we want it to make that nice crease in the body of the glass. Sandy here is doing a bit of feathering, boosting a little bit of extra heat into that body of material. Nice, and she's folding it over. So that was a really, really cool move to see. So those creases kind of acted as a way for the glass to naturally want to fold over itself. And it looks like we're almost done with the piece. The majority of the shaping is completed. Now all we need to do is flatten out the base of it or what's connected to the pipe, and we can kind of do that by boosting in a little bit of heat into that back one more time. So using this hot torch, we can blast it really directly right in that back portion and push the glass back up on itself, creating a nice flat spot for us to break the piece off of the pipe. And also another really nice thing about this torch that Kelly is using is that we can dial the flame to different sizes and different intensities. So we have a much more broad flame here. The candles are a little bit longer where the majority of that really intense heat is coming from. Um, so that kind of allows us to get a little bit more of a soaking heat into a larger portion. When we were applying, or when Kelly was applying um, the stars and the moons, she had a really, really concentrated flame to just heat up and get those stringers really, really hot to paint it on. And now we're boosting in a little bit more of a broader heat. So by rolling back and forth on the rails here, we're kind of evenly heating that entire surface of material. And that's gonna allow us to push it back and create a nice flat spot. And another really, really cool thing about doing this and heating up that portion of the material, so 
Uh, glass has a really, really good heat memory. It knows what areas are hot and it will retain that heat in that one spot. So by boosting the heat uh, with this torch here and then going in to take a flash, that portion of the glass is going to get hotter than the rest of the body here. It's already set up and structurally stable. So by boosting that heat, we're not only flashing the piece, making sure it stays a nice even temperature, but we're also really adding in the heat into that ring of, of heat that's being focused into the back. And we can see that here, that ring of heat, uh, when we come out of, of the chamber. We can really kind of see where that heat's being focused. So Sandy's gonna take one more good flash. We can really see the heat being focused right on the end of that, uh, right towards the blowpipe. So now that we have that heat boosted back in, we're gonna hold it up and cap, and it's kind of slowly falling back on itself and it's going to slowly kind of create um, a flat spot for the piece to rest. And what's really handy is they did enough boosting in temperature to make sure that that area is going to stay hot for, for a while. So by going in here and taking a heat, the rest of the piece is cold enough to where if it, it can withstand the temperature of being in there for a lot longer uh, without losing its structure. And we can kind of see here the motion that Kelly is doing. She's capping the end of the pipe with her thumb and that's kind of creating a vacuum. It's not allowing any air to escape so the piece isn't going to slump in on itself and that bubble's not going to collapse. It's going to nice and evenly uh, kind of fall back on itself without losing any uh, air pressure on the inside. If she were to let go with the thumb, the air would be able to fall out of the piece in, in a sense, uh, and that bubble would kind of collapse down on itself. So we've got a nice evened out form going back in right before we take the piece off with the jack line. Making sure that that's nice and reinforced because we want that line to be significantly smaller. Um, that area is where we can isolate that stress that's going to be introduced in the glass right before we remove it from the pipe. So by boosting that heat back in, we're making sure that that neckline is nice and reinforced, ready to come off the pipe. So just squeezing a little bit more, tightening it down a little bit. And now comes the part of the process where we're flashing the piece down, uh, which is a very important process uh, right at the end of, the, of, the, uh, of making the piece because that's what's going to stabilize the body, make sure everything once again, it's a, it's a recurring vocabulary term, making sure everything is nice and homogenous. We want everything to be nice and even. We don't want one area to be too hot uh, as opposed to another. Otherwise, it's going to deform and slump when we go to load it away inside of our annealing oven. doing a little bit more boosting in temperature in the back. Excellent. 
Awesome. So we're making sure everything is nice and, and centered up where it needs to be. We can see what's really amazing is when, the, when different colors heat up, um, they're kind of always going to glow a nice orange when it's very, very molten. But what's really, really nice about certain blue colors is when they have a lot of heat in them, they turn this really, really nice pink, this really pretty pink color. But that pink color is an indicator that it's still a little bit too hot to be removed from the pipe. We want to see a little bit more of that blue come back before we're ready for it to be removed from, uh, from the pipe here. So taking a couple flashes, allowing it to really cool down. Kelly's coming in and out of the reheat chamber, staying out for longer than being in, but that's to stabilize. Make sure everything is nice and even, and then we can go ahead and get ready. We're really looking for to make sure there's no movement in the body of glass, in the bubble, and to look at color. So we can still see a little bit of that pink, so that's an indicator that it's still just a little bit too hot. So we spend a little, little bit more time outside of the reheat chamber than we do um, on the inside of it. And while Kelly is going ahead and preparing uh, this to be removed from the pipe, Sandy's getting suited up in some Kevlar gloves and a face shield so that way he can handle the glass for a brief period of time uh, to load it away inside of our annealing oven for slow cooling. It gives those gloves a little bit of a preheat here. Because you can actually shock the glass if those gloves are cold. And that can be a little bit too cold of a temperature and we can crack the glass that way. So by preheating them a little bit in front of the reheat chamber, that kind of helps mitigate that issue. So they're going to go ahead and take the final flash here. Sandy's ready here with our gloves and face shield. And we're just going to walk this on over. This is our knockoff station that's lined with fiber fracks, which is a heat resistant insulation that just adds, works as a nice padding uh, for the glass to rest on. So we're shocking this with a little bit of cold water uh, in a bucket, and we're scoring it with some cold tools, so just a pair of tweezers. And all it takes here is just a vibration on the pipe, and the piece breaks free. Sandy goes over to our kneeling oven and rests the glass inside safely, setting it on its side. Excellent. And now we have a finished piece. So that's been loaded away inside of our annealing oven for safe cooling. So this piece of equipment here is very, very vital for the glass making process. Without this piece of equipment here, we would not be able to keep any of the pieces that we make. So um, this piece of equipment is holding at about 915 degrees, and that's a stable temperature for the glass to rest at. It's not cold enough for it to crack and it's not hot enough to cause any deformation or slumping of the material. So we could leave it in there for a week and it would go unchanged. It would be perfectly fine. But at the end of the day, we're gonna press a button on our control panel that's going to slowly ramp the temperature down from 915. It was pretty thin. It was a thin bubble. Uh, we didn't really need it to be very thick. So it can probably be done on our normal cycle about 16 hours or so, 14, 16, 18 hours, something along those lines. Not a whole lot of time uh, in, in the scheme of annealing. Um, but some of our pieces here in the collection uh, at the glass pavilion are comprised of much thicker pieces of glass. Uh, and the thicker the glass gets, uh, that time that it takes to anneal exponentially increases. So um, if those of you who are familiar with the glass pavilion and have been here before, those of you who have not, we have our ancient gallery, and in the center of that gallery is a thick glass bench that was solid, casted into sand. And at its thickest point, it's about three foot thick. Uh, and that piece of glass annealed for 11 months to properly alleviate the stress built into the material. Uh, and it is just amazing that glass has that kind of quality uh, where, you know, it has to relieve that pressure and that stress from it being heated over and over and over again throughout the process of making. But that wraps it up for our first demonstration for the day. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Definitely tune in for our uh, two, four, and six o'clock demonstrations. Um, and we thank you so much for watching.